We'll talk about brain fog today. We're going to talk about brain fog and how to bring clarity to your thoughts if you have brain fog. So I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a certified functional medicine practitioner. I'm a chiropractor uh, since 1979. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractor. And uh, these two disciplines came together to enable me to sit here and function normally and actually speak to people coherently, which wasn't necessarily the case mm -hmm. uh, even as late as five or six years ago oh, when Dr. Gates arrived here. So we kind of put this program together to address chronic pain. We put together a functional neurology, which works with stimulating the brain and uh, stimulating specific parts of the brain and creating something called neuroplasticity and making your brain work right. Except to do that to the best possible ability or the best, with the best possible, to get the best possible results, you kind of need to clean up the chemistry of the brain. And that's where the functional medicine comes in. That's how, what helped me. We smushed them together. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and, and I semi inadvertently have developed a um, chronic pain practice and autoimmune practice, mm -hmm. a mini post-traumatic stress syndrome practice, mm -hmm. because these things all go together. And I think one of the most common symptoms that I have heard in doing the intakes over the mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. has been brain fog. Exactly. I don't think that there is any symptom that is even close to being more common uh, in all of the things that we treat than brain fog. We're going to particularly uh, apparently allude to fibromyalgia a bit today because every fibromyalgia patient has brain fog. But people come in for brain fog. They come in for memory loss, okay, which can be a part of this, but we're going to do a separate presentation on short and long-term memory mm -hmm. loss, maybe as soon as next week. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, th this is so complex, and yet in my observation, it also is one of the symptoms that um, responds the best. Exactly. To, to the exactly. types of procedures that we have developed for addressing <clears throat> chronic pain problems. And so uh, this is a great topic. I can't believe that I know we never thought of doing it sooner because it's like, it's not like we haven't had a million topics to do, right? But it's, this one's, I think, so right in front of our face right, every day. Right. It's like, uh, you know, and, and so when Dr. Gates said, let's do brain fog, it's like, yeah, let's do brain fog. So let's do brain fog. So overview, what do we see with patients who have brain fog and the prevalence of it in our clinic, we just kind of sort of a little discussed, but why don't you give an overview so they know everything we're going to talk about here. Um, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and kind of pique their interest a little bit. Absolutely. So as you were saying, it's almost every patient that comes into this clinic has brain fog, probably because we treat primarily patients with depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. We do treat a lot of other conditions like dizziness and vertigo, but also peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is not as much involved with this, a lot of but everything stuff. else we said, we have a neurological focus in our clinic, as Dr. Rutherford said, that the metabolic aspects have to be paid attention to because if somebody has an autoimmune response that's messing up their brain, you can do brain rehab, so to speak, till the cows come home, but the person's not going to get better. <clears throat> so we're taking patients through our sequential logarithmic process and fixing their physiology, which we'll get into later on, we have seen brain fog to largely go away in most of our patients. So it's pretty cool. And brain fog is one of the most disabling features of many of these illnesses. So patients who have fibromyalgia frequently will say, well, my brain fog is the most outstanding feature yeah. of what I have going on. Yes, the pain is horrible. Yes, I'm very sensitive to pressure, but it's the brain fog that is driving me nuts. Yeah, and even though we have to address a lot of different uh, maybe vicious cycles or different organ systems to help a person get completely through whatever they've come in with, let's say fibromyalgia patient with brain fog. It seems like brain fog is one of the earliest symptoms to start lifting, mm -hmm. kind of giving the patient some mm -hmm. confidence, like maybe we know, maybe these guys know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Cause it's scary. Absolutely. It's scary to people. People who come in with brain fog and memory loss. They're, they're all thinking the same thing. Some of them say it don't, some of them don't. They're thinking I'm going Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. That's what they're thinking. And brain fog is part of something called minimal cognitive impairment, which can be a precursor to Alzheimer's. Now, there are studies where they've looked at patients who have fibromyalgia for seven years and they don't see them going into Alzheimer's, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to go into it because we've seen patients who have had fibromyalgia for a long period of time 
who then transitioned into Alzheimer's. And we felt the brain fog was definitely part of it because the underlying mechanisms are exactly the same, same. frankly, exactly. between your brain fog and Alzheimer's. Now there are genetics involved. So for you to get Alzheimer's, you have to have a certain set of genetics or maybe your genetics may predispose you to it. But everything we're talking about today are the same inflammatory variables that are associated with dementia and associated with brain fog. It's just, when are you catching them on the spectrum? How about a semi, <clears throat> this is an amorphous thing, this brain fog. I know I've had it, you know, I just, there, there are times when, when I, when I wasn't doing well and I'd be in there do, examining a patient and I, suddenly I just couldn't think. And I would literally have to excuse myself mm -hmm. and say, you know what, I really got to apologize, but I just, I just need to take a break right now or something like that. Or when Dr. Gates is here, then I, you know, I could bring him in. I don't have that anymore, but that's kind of like a general uh, feel of it. But it's, but there's some more specificities than that. You want to kind of give them maybe a, maybe a generally specific definition mm -hmm. of brain fog and we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So basically it's reduced cognition. That's how they term it. You want to, you want to define cognition for those of us. Who know well, your ability to think. So your ability to think, your ability to process thoughts, to take in what other people are saying and then digest that, make your own conclusions, create a plan of action. That's basically cognition. All of that. And Doing an exam and all of a sudden you can't put it together. It's like, what do I do next? Okay, this was that. What does that mean? I can't write it down on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. That's reduced cognition. Mm -hmm. And in the fibromyalgia literature, this started out as being termed discognition. So it wasn't called brain fog. It was called discognition. So it's just their ability to think was abnormal. Their ability to concentrate, that's also part of brain fog, is abnormal. You just can't hold your focus. And then short-term and long-term memory are also involved with this as well. So many so there of you, are a lot of conditions that have those features. There are a lot of conditions and there's some pretty complex neuroanatomy and neurophysiology involved, which we're we'll, not going to go into. We'll probably go into that more <laughs> next week. Oh, okay. Yeah. And our short term and long term memory. Oh, broadcast. okay. The loop. Yeah. We'll the go into the, and the hippocampus. Exactly. We'll go okay. into That's not that complicated. We can pull that, up. but we'll go into it. <laughs> and just know that, for example, if you have trouble finding your words, which a lot of patients relate to us, very common or if you just can't remember names, or if you're really bad at math, that's more likely a left hemisphere problem. So the left side of your brain relates to your left frontal lobe talking to your left temporal lobe. That connection is not working as well. Whereas if you can't remember how to get to Susie's house since they cut down the tree that was the landmark for you, then you probably have more of a right frontal lobe and right temporal lobe problem. So we know that certain characteristics that are seen in certain sides of the brain We'll just say that, you know, as, as humans are largely wired similarly, um, the brain develops in a similar fashion for most people. We all have different experiences that affect the brain throughout life. But we will say in the patient population we see, we most commonly see left frontal lobe issues in the patients more, more than just the right frontal lobe. But both sides are involved, but usually the left frontal lobe is involved more with the fibromyalgia patients, with the chronic fatigue patients. And that's why it's so common to say, man, I just can't remember names or... I just, I can't find the right word. And in neurology, this isn't really a, a diagnostic entity. Brain fog is not a diagnostic entity. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that now is being discussed more often in the rheumatology literature. So in medical neurology, Dr. <clears throat> Gates is talking about your classic neurologist who are not cutting down, your classic neurologist who has been trained in pathology. Oh, you kind of got brain fog, you're losing your memory, let's do an MRI, we did an MRI, it's normal. Okay. well. You're okay. Right. So, uh, and we're in functional neurology, chiropractic neurology. The huge difference here is that, is that even if the MRI is normal, which it is 99% of the time or more in the patients that come in here, um, you can actually change that frontal lobe function by addressing some of the things we're going to talk about and by using a, uh, a method of, of stimulating it with exercises mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that your brain needs proper oxygen. A lot of the things we're gonna talk about destroy the oxygen. It needs proper blood sugar. If your blood sugar is high or low, let me tell you, your brain's not doing as well as it should be. It needs a lack of inflammation, okay? And it needs proper stimulation. Your left frontal lobe, if you're having that, is not getting proper stimulation. Whether you got whacked in the head a couple of times and got some concussions, which I've had too. <laughs> 
giving you a bad blood brain barrier, which Dr. Gates is going to talk about and, or, and I'm just telling you this, so you keep listening because I want you to know there's a solution for this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, or the chemistry that's causing your frontal lobe to not function right. In addition to the poor stimulation. And there are a lot of things that are making your chemistry not right. And we're going to talk about probably all of them. Okay. So stay tuned because we're going to tell you why you have brain fog and that there is something that can be done about it. No sales pitch there. I just don't, I just wanted you to like hang in there so you could, could so mm -hmm. you can know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some of the diagnoses? Were you going to go somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can go somewhere it's okay. else. It's okay. So the brain fog pertains to a number of things. It pertains to autism. Now autism is pretty demonstrative. So autistic patients have a, or autism, autism spectrum disorder patients can have a wide range of symptoms from not being able to verbally communicate. Their nonverbal communication can be really poor or uh, subpar is maybe a better way to say it to the Asperger's patient who is highly intelligent, but is unable to really socially interact with people. And brain fog is part of the autism spectrum disorders. And what they think is going on is, and that we'll get into is that there's immune inflammation. And then it's also seen with celiac disease, which is an autoimmune problem. It's seen with fibromyalgia, as we've talked about, it's seen with chronic fatigue. These all have autoimmune correlates. It's seen with chemotherapy. So when people are taking chemotherapy, the chemotherapy medication actually releases inflammatory chemicals in your body to help kill the cancer, and those can affect your brain. So now they're calling it chemo fog, just like for fibromyalgia, they call it fibro fog. And the last, or a couple of the other ones are POTS, that's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So these are people who stand up and all of a sudden their heart starts racing and they have brain fog associated with their condition. Then they sit down and they still have brain fog. And there's an autoimmune component to POTS as well. And then there's another condition called mastocytosis where you have too many mast cells. They contain histamine, which is associated with like allergic responses. And these folks have brain fog as well. So we'll go into really what's going on with each one of these. So all of those things alter chemistry largely, you heard, largely autoimmune, but in the end, for all you inflammation fans, okay, largely inflammatory mm -hmm. responses that cross the blood brain barrier. Or break down the blood brain barrier. Or break down the blood brain barrier and cross it and get into your brain. And now the chemistry in your brain is bad. I want to emphasize this because a lot of people come in and it's just like, look, this is going south. I just need to try harder. I just need to try harder. I'm doing brain exercises. It's not working. Dr. Gates is going to talk to you that the brain exercises might even fatigue you and, and give you a, an issue there. If you want to talk about it now, exactly. that's fine. Yeah. So, but I'm trying to bring us into the, the, the reality of most of you are not going Alzheimer's. Now there's, there are, there are diagrams or whatever you want to call it, grading systems that'll tell you like the first two stages, everybody, if you look at it, everybody on the planet's in Alzheimer's. Okay. But most of you have these things, these conditions, these biochemical pathways, these biochemical reactions that are causing the brain fog. So just know it's kind of not you. It's kind of like your brain is under attack by, and, and, and that attack generally can be either eliminated or calmed down in, in most cases. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And as you were saying, patients want to do brain exercises, they want to try harder. And that's actually part of the characterization of brain fog. So patients will have just their decreased ability to concentrate or focus or think. So they actually try harder. They've seen this in functional MRI studies. So you try harder to be able to to execute the mental task. And then that creates fatigue in and of itself. I was doing that when you got here. Exactly. And so you're always trying to think and that is incredibly exhausting. Really, the solution is to figure out why do you have to concentrate harder in order to get your brain to work. And so it really comes down to inflammation. That's the bottom line. And once again, an autoimmune disorder mm -hmm. or neuroimmune disorder. It's a neuroimmune disorder. And within our ability to think, let's just boil it down to some really elementary steps. So let's say you have brain cell here and then you have brain cell here. This brain cell has to secrete so many neurotransmitters, neurochemicals to excite this brain cell for you to have a thought. Let's just say it that way. Well, if you have a lot of inflammation in the system, this guy is not gonna get activated unless you produce a lot of neurochemicals because this guy is so inflamed and sick, it can't, it can't work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that a good analogy? To me. Okay, good. So, <laughs> I'm a simple guy, so he assumes it makes sense. <laughs> 
we're always looking for that because I can talk to them. We're blue in the face, but if it doesn't make sense to you out there who has fibromyalgia, then there's no point in us talking about it. So in essence, again, this neuroinflammation inflames your brain cells. It makes them sick so they can't work correctly. So then you have to recruit more brain power. Think of it that way in order to get this guy to work. And then that's incredibly fatiguing. Yeah. And that's why you go through the day and you just really don't feel good. And you have your brain fog. And they've actually shown that, for example, fibromyalgia patients who have brain fog, their fibromyalgia is statistically more severe than those who don't have severe brain fog. I, I can believe that. Yeah. Yeah, for those of you who watch us, because and it apparently <coughs> a lot, and we really appreciate it. Um, we're just trying to get this out. Some of you might say, "Man, all you guys talking about is the gut. All you talk about is brain. All you talk about is is uh, uh, thyroid. <laughs> mm -hmm. All you talk about is immune problems. All you talk about is stress." It's like because that's the core. That is the core of so much of what the government is now saying we need to take care of, which is chronic pain. We're going to take care of it by walking and that's fine. And we're going to take care of it by getting our diabetes under control and that's fine. And that's all good. But I'm not hearing anybody talk about autoimmune problems, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, the gut is now being massively uh, uh, researched, which is a good thing. And, and, and watch our gut stuff. You can't, all the things that are coming from the gut now, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, MS connections, uh, uh, was it Sjogren's mm -hmm. connections, and these are all autoimmune problems. You're going to see that these, um, that there's a theme, that there's a theme, and it's not as all over the place as, as it's been presented for years and years and years and years and years. And this is huge because when your blood brain barrier breaks down um and and things start getting in there there's a that barrier is there to keep all of the stuff out that we're talking about when it starts leaking in those brain neurons start getting inflamed like dr gates just got done saying you have a lack of oxygen you smoke a lot you have copd you have anemia you have something like that you have uh you have a, a number of things we're going to talk about you have celiac now your your gut barrier is broken down now you got toxins getting out of there you got things getting out of there, food sensitivities that are causing immune inflammation because they're passing your blood brain barrier. This is, this, this is, this is chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And, and we, and what we just said was no matter what people come in with, if there is a brain involvement, which there is with most of our patients, they have brain fog. Mm -hmm. They have brain fog. Mm -hmm. All of these, we can, we could take hours and go through chronic fatigue, myalgia, mastocytosis, POTS, mm -hmm. and, and, and define the pathways for you as to how they, mm -hmm. they mess up your brain. But they all mess up your brain. Pretty much everything that happens from here down mm -hmm. messes, messes up, up your brain. brain. Absolutely. So let's go into the blood-brain barrier a little bit more because I yeah. think a lot of people may not fully understand this. I, I think that would be a great idea. So there are two <laughs> main barriers. You caught that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, the first main barrier is your skin, which prevents us from getting infections which is a really good thing. But then our next barrier is our gastrointestinal tract, which is also made up of basically skin. And that skin is bound together by, think of them as little zippers. And we've talked about this in other broadcasts, but we'll just go through it really quick. Well, if that zipper mechanism holding skin cell A to skin cell B doesn't work well, then the zipper opens up. Now food molecules that are bigger than should be digested and absorbed start getting into your bloodstream, your immune system starts attacking them because it says, what the heck is this guy doing here? This looks like a bacteria or pieces of bacteria get into the bloodstream and it creates a lot of immune cell activation. That immune activation can then spread throughout the body and can result in a host of different circumstances depending on what your genetics are and what food molecules are getting through and what bacterial components are getting through. It can result from type two diabetes to type one diabetes to Hashimoto's thyroiditis where the immune system causes the thyroid, RA, it goes on and on. Now, some of the chemicals that we eat or consume can actually break down this gastrointestinal barrier. The same chemicals are now being thought to break down the barrier that forms the blood brain barrier, which is your blood vessels going into your brain. And your blood vessels are bound together again by pretty much the same zipper mechanism. So once they open up, then inflammation from the neck down, as Dr. Rutherford said, now goes into your brain. And now the inflammation is in your brain your brain is not made to have that much inflammation. Your brain actually has a separate immune system from the rest of your body. 
And then that immune system starts saying, what the heck, there's inflammation here. So we have to go on high alert. We have to create more inflammation. We may have to kill some brain cells in this process. Yes, brain cells do get killed. And then as a consequence, now you can't think. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, so you have to fix everything from here down. And, and one of the hints as to whether you might have both these, and this isn't definitive, okay? If you don't have these, it doesn't mean that you don't have a broken down gut barrier and blood brain barrier. But if you have like chemo sensitivities, if you have, if you find like perfumes really get you, uh, you can't walk in the room and go, Dr. Rutherford, I can't believe you wore cologne because I, I have these sensitivities. Um, if you have sensitivities to soaps and shampoos and things of that nature, if you wear, if you wear like a, a watch and, and the watch turns you, these are, th these are signs that you've lost chemical tolerance. And some people would say that's liver and certainly there's a phase two pathway that does that, but that's significantly coincides with people who tend to have bad gut and blood brain barriers. And those people are usually going to have brain fog too. Just a practical kind of mm -hmm. a, a clinical pearl for you there. Now, if you don't have that, that doesn't mean you don't have a bad blood and brain barrier. If you've had multiple concussions, well, even if you've had one concussion. Mm -hmm. it breaks there, down your blood brain barrier. Yeah, it breaks down your blood brain barrier. So you have a blood brain barrier. You're watching this interesting <laughs> debate now on the NFL. Have you been keeping up with it? I've been, you, have you been nerding it. out. So I've been, been nerding been, out, but I actually but you have been that. keeping up at it. When he nerds out and goes into like he's doing research, it's like he doesn't, he doesn't know <laughs> like that the world has ended or anything like that. So, uh, but that's, but that's kind of comical to us to listen to that whole thing, go back and forth. These guys have bad, every one of them has bad blood brain barrier. If you've got a hit to your head, you had a car accident, you know, so there's so many things. I mean, we got a head, we're in gravity, we're, we're in the world. We hit our head on our beam, we, we do that. We're stressed out of our minds. Stress hormones mm -hmm. break down Absolutely. the blood brain barrier. Okay, so a lot of things break down the blood brain barrier and then you go to your doctor and they take an MRI and it's normal. Mm -hmm. You say, I can't think, I think I'm having mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. I guess they're looking for the placking. And if it's not there, then, then that's what they're looking for. Well, the, you know, on the MRI or did I yeah, skip too far ahead? No, it's okay. With Alzheimer's, they're looking for volumetric loss. They may do a spec scan. They're going to do a memory test with you. And most likely, you're going to be a little abnormal, but not abnormal enough to be Alzheimer's. Um, and so that's what they've shown with patients who have brain fog. And I think let's just use chronic fatigue as an example of some of the complexities involved. Because yesterday we had a patient who had chronic fatigue and I started labeling out all the things that are potentially wrong and they were actually really surprised because we try to distill things down so it makes sense to everybody because there's no sense in us just pontificating up here about all the stuff we know. If it doesn't help you, there's no point to that. So we want you to get the picture. But kind of drawing that picture, for example, with chronic fatigue syndrome, what are the steps that we're thinking of that are causing someone to be fatigued and have brain fog? Certainly you have to evaluate, are they depressed? Because that can be part of it. But there's a tremendous amount of literature now coming out saying that chronic fatigue patients absorb too many bacterial components from their gut. So that ties in with the leaky gut thing. Once you have that, you have to look at every food sensitivity that person may have. You have to look at the microbial, the microbes in their gut. You have to look at their stress hormones, as Dr. Rutherford was saying, because that will break down the gut. You have to look at their insulin levels, because that will be thrown off once they start absorbing pieces of bacteria. Then you have to look at what is their immune system doing, because the immune system activation can cause fatigue in and of itself. Just like when you have a cold or a flu, you're fatigued. A lot of chronic fatigue patients have that immune activation going all the time. You have to look and see, do they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where their immune system is killing the thyroid, because that will cause fatigue, independent of what their thyroid tests show. And directly screws up your left midbrain and causes short-term memory loss and brain fog. <laughs> exactly. See, I mean, I just mentioned yeah. that to show there are vicious cycles that need to be teased out. And then there are viruses. So does there, this chronic fatigue person have Epstein-Barr? Some people think Epstein-Barr is all of chronic fatigue. It's not. It's a piece of it. And then you have to look and see, do they have mitochondrial problems? Their ability to make energy, is that compromised? There's actually a little thing called a mitochondria that makes energy in our cells. And that's actually part of brain fog for chronic fatigue patients. They're theorizing that the mitochondria are not working well, again, due to the immune activation that we've been talking about because the blood brain barrier breaks down. So just from that, I hope you can kind of get a feel for exactly what's going on with this. And in terms of solutions, so you're probably wondering, well, what can I do about it? What you can do about it is you need to have your gastrointestinal barrier and your blood brain barrier assessed. That's number one. 
because basically we have found that to be the cause of a lot of these autoimmune problems or bacterial issues going on in the body and then making sure that inflammation doesn't get into the brain. And then you have to figure out the right diet for the person. You have to figure out what their, the diet is not only in terms of their, what you would appreciate as food allergies, which are really food intolerances, but you have to think of it in terms of what their diet should be in terms of their bacteria in their gut. And then you have to do all these things to calm down stress mechanisms. And once you do that and you heal up these barriers, then you can actually go in and start rehabbing the brain and get the brain stronger. And that's where our patients have relayed tremendous improvement in their brain fog, their ability to think, their ability to remember, their short-term memories back. And frankly, that's probably one of the most rewarding aspects of what we do because memory or disturbance of memory or ability to think is one of the most, I don't know, unnerving symptoms that our patients come with. Well, with the Alzheimer's thing out there, the way it is and mm -hmm. with it being so prevalent now, and it's, it's, I'm finding that in, when I'm interviewing patients, like initially, they'll frequently break down, start, start crying. And, and, and then usually a, a, with further interview, you'll find that they had Alzheimer's in their family or their aunt had it, or they get a friend that's right. got it. They're afraid right. that they're going to get it. Right. And, and I think with that background, it really is disturbing. It's disturbing to walk in and I've been there, man, let me tell you, I've been there. It's disturbing to walk into a room or, I mean, I've done, I, I mean, full disclosure, I've done full interviews of patients for an hour or exams for an hour. And literally that afternoon, I couldn't even remember that I had examined that person. That gets a little interesting. So you start thinking, you start worrying about, you know, where's this He's going? a lot better now, by the way. That was <laughs> yeah, years yeah. Ago. I am. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it's, that, it starts gets, that starts to get interesting. You start thinking, where's this going? You know, where's this going and what's happening? And I go, now my dad had Alzheimer's to the point where the the last couple of years of his life when i went home but i would be sitting at the dinner table and he would lean over to my my mother and say who's this guy again you know and then i got that picture and i'm like forgetting the you know who i even who i even uh, interviewed that morning and it and it could get it's pretty scary mm -hmm. with all the things that are going out there used to be that's ah, just old age we now know it's not just old age almost never I mean, no, we could get into that. Well, we should do one on that. It's not just old age because mm -hmm. that I get that so much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's scary, but it's chemistry. It's stress hormones. It's gut issues. It's, 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 it's all of those things. It's like this, if you've listened to us a lot, okay, we have one enclosed environment. We want to know, they ask me all the time, what is it that's creating all of these chronic pain situations? My simple, my short answer is, and I don't have many short answers, let me tell you. <laughs> my short answer is, you have an internal environment that is adapted to uh, a, a certain external environment and they play together to create balance. You're in balance, you're good. Over the last 50 or 60 years, we have introduced a lot of variables into that external environment that are disturbing our internal environment. I'm not, and everybody, first thing I say is, yeah, the foods. Yeah, the foods too. Yeah, the foods too. But we're talking about stresses. We're talking about, you know, working families, two, two, working fam two, two people working families with kids that they got to put here. We're talking about financial stresses. We're talking about a lot of divorce. We're talking about tons of and we're not anti-medicine but we're talking about uh, antibiotics that 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 became used for everything and that has interfered with our internal biochemistry a la we have kids and people with with that antibiotic resistant bacteria god knows look and don't get don't go off on this on me god knows you know we got like 50 or 60 vaccinations we're given to people uh by the time they're seven or eight years old it practically okay not not getting into the there's just a practicality that that makes us wonder given the fact that mainly what we see is autoimmune patients is that okay we don't know i'm not jumping one side or the other but you can go into this whole thing okay and all of this comes together to imbalance that environment in our systems and that's what chronic pain is the most sensitive part of the system and correct me if i am wrong and this is just from observation, he's the brain guy, okay, is the brain. Mm -hmm. And the cerebellum, I think, I, to me, almost seems like, and we do a lot of work with cerebellum, dizziness, vertigo, mm -hmm. balance, a lot of things like that. 
almost seems like it's sensitive to everything. So the point is, there's no magic bullet, there's no pill, there's no this. You have to create, the whole point of that diatribe was, you have to create an environment, again, that's in balance, that's not inflamed, that's got enough oxygen, that's getting enough stimulation, your kids aren't sitting on their rear ends, you know, nine hours a day doing, uh, doing computer stuff instead of going out and, and playing like we did. And I understand the barriers on that, but nature doesn't. So that's where we're at. So if you got brain fog, you have to treat the whole thing. If you have, a, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you have to treat the whole thing. If you have a gut problem, you have to treat the whole thing. This is where we're missing it. We're missing it in the, you have to, okay, you're going to take this pill for that. Or you're going to take, what's the, what's the pill for brain fog now? Uh, uh, new vigil. New vigil. vigil. That's it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say our doc, our doc, mm -hmm. <laughs> we have an osteopath that we work with who loves new vigil. It works. Okay. But it's not balancing your chemistry. And so that's really kind of the overview of what Dr. Gates is talking about relative to your brain fog. You have to treat all those other things, preferably with little to no drugs and preferably with even, with even little to no supplements, although we use both. Okay. Mm -hmm. We use both, but as little as possible, because if you want that environment to come back to natural, the less things that you use to interfere with the gazillions, there's a scientific term for you, of biochemical pathways in your system, most of which we don't even know what they are yet, is, is, uh, is probably not the best approach. You probably want to try to get that body working as much on its own as you can. And you know what? It does if you do it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to say the right way or properly, but I think mm -hmm. I think we've seen our, our, our paradigm be pretty consistently successful. Mm -hmm. So my brain's working today, so you were the recipient of that <laughs> for, the, for good or the bad. <laughs> so... That's funny. So is that it? That's it. I think we covered it. Did that, was that okay? That was great. It was great. All right. That's exactly. no, true. I mean, you said it Thank perfectly. You. That's Thank what you. it is. I think we've overcomplicated a lot of these problems. It works tremendously well for certain things like infectious disease. You want to have a test that says you have this disease or not, and let's give you an antibody. That's pathology. That's pathology. But the problem is with chronic disease, which is now 120 million Americans, that paradigm doesn't really work that well because of problems are so multifactorial. And so like Dr. Rutherford's saying, we've lost balance, we've kind of lost the basics, we've lost the simplicity. And because of that, the gut barrier, the brain barrier breaking down, the brain is deranged in terms of stress responses, it keeps the whole thing going. And then we have 120 million Americans running around with chronic pain. Two thirds of the population has- 130. 130, now. sorry, 130. Two thirds of the population has a weight problem. One out of three females now has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. One out of three. Autoimmune yeah, disorders are not supposed to happen. It's just, the numbers just keep growing. One in 68 now have autism. I, sorry, but it's kind of time to wake up. It's, it is. It's we got to get to wake up. We got to get back to basics. <laughs> back to basics, baby. <laughs> we got to get back. I wrote a book called Back to Basics back in, in 1990. Don't look it up. Don't buy it because. I, I need to write an addendum to it and say, now, if you've done everything I told you to do in this book and you haven't gotten better, here's why. The here's why is all the videos we've been doing for the last two and a half years. So, so uh, anyway, so, okay. That's so that's it. That's our, that's my going off diatribe for the day, but that is brain fog. It is scary, but it is for the most part, it is very recoverable and that's the cool part. So mm -hmm. uh, any, experience. if you have any ideas about any properly topics, selected patients. What's that? In the properly selected patients. In the properly selected say. patients, yes. And that's true. No, yeah. no, no, that has to be. Yeah, we don't feel that. yeah, there are some people who can't respond to the types mm -hmm. of things we do for sure. Okay. So that's it. Brain fog. Probably overdid it. But we will see you next week. You have any suggestions for any uh, topics that you'd like to hear us talk about? Um, we treat a lot of stuff. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't even close to discussed it all in all this time. So uh, you feel welcome to send them to us, uh, powerhealthtalk.com. If you want to know any of our other uh, topics that we've talked about, you go there, go to the Hangouts, scroll down to whatever it is you wanted to see, and, um, and, and just punch it, and there we are. So we will see you next week, uh, probably late again. <laughs>
<laughs> it's usually at 9.30. So those of you hanging there until 9.40, thank you. So we'll see you next week. Thanks right. for watching.